Good morning, everyone. Let's just uh, give it a few moments. Can I ask who is a Zoom user? Can you guys hear me okay? I can hear you. I just, um, I'm not sure who that is. Zoom user, can you please identify yourself or else I'm going to have to remove you from the room? Uh, the Zoom user texted and said he is memled. Ah, okay. Got it. Thank you. All right, let's get going. Uh, there. All right. Okay. <clears throat> So this is a uh, six month old who um, was identified to have this EKG and I was asked to offer a second opinion at some point in the last few weeks. So uh, let's see, uh, what do you think uh, Ivana, what should we be doing for this patient? Good morning, Dr. Yeah. Pass. Yeah, and what um, is wrong with this patient? So looking right off the bat, um, trying to establish um, whether this is sinus or not. Um, right away, what strikes me is that there does not a P before every QRS that I can identify, or if there is, there's a pretty significant um, PR interval, um, particularly with the second beat that I can see. Um, and it seems to um, kind of carry through, uh, through parts of the rhythm or through the strip. So we see a prolonged PR after the second B, third B, and then it kind of gets closer again uh, to the fourth. So I need to establish that um, it's properly conducting. Um, before I kind of go forward, I was gonna look at the relative rate, um, which appears to be around 75. So relatively slow for someone this, this age. Mm -hmm. um, then looking at the actual QRSs as well, you know, they seem to change. Um, let's see. Uh, no, excuse me. My bad. Um, and then looking at the QT intervals, um, they actually look for the most part. Okay. From what I can see quickly here. Mm hmm. Um, so I'm just trying to march out the P waves and see if there is conduction. So is the P wave rate faster or slower than the QRS rate? It looks like the P wave rate. Um, I'm just trying to. It looks like it's faster than the QR or the QRS rate or the yeah, ventricular rate. Yeah, substantially faster. How fast is the the look and lead to? What's the P wave rate? It's closer to like 120, 130. Uh huh. Would that rate be more appropriate in your mind for a six month old than a rate of 70? Significantly more appropriate. Yeah, I agree with that statement. Now, um, so what do you think this is? So is this first degree heart block? Um, no, I don't think this is first degree heart block. Okay. Is this um, third degree heart block? I don't think it's third degree because I do think that there is an association when the P wave does conduct. Um, I'm thinking more so along, along the lines of second degree heart block with this patient. Okay. So one of the nice clues about uh, heart block, particularly complete heart block, if you're ever trying to figure out if someone's in complete heart block, is to look at the R to R interval. And mm -hmm. um, now over long periods of time, of course, the R to R interval is going to change. People who are in complete heart block can have heart rates that vary as well, although less variability than people who's AV node is conducting. But I think you would agree that on a on a typical strip, though, um, if someone is in complete heart block, the R to R interval does not really change all that much. That's true. And, and so um, if you look at the strip, I think it's I think we would all agree that the R to R interval here is pretty much fixed. Uh, maybe it's off by a few milliseconds, but it's not varying at all. And there are mm -hmm. a number of P waves that if there was conduction would bring the QRS in earlier, okay? 
So although it does appear, as you were suggesting, that like this PR might be conducting and this one might be conducting, first of all, I'm not aware of any condition where the PR interval gets shorter mm -hmm. in production, right? Usually it gets longer, 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 and then you block if it were moments one. But this is the actually appears to be almost the opposite of that. And then there's a P wave in the T wave. So this is actually complete heart block. Um, where there is no um, consistent relationship between the P wave and the QRS, right? We have a P wave on the T wave here. There's a P wave uh, at the beginning of the T wave here. Here it's at the end of the T wave. Here there's one right just before the T wave. Here there's one before the, uh, you know, the QT intervals just starting at the very start. So it, there's completely uh, VA dissociation and AV dissociation. So this is complete heart block. So, so now you have the six month old and uh, is there anything you want to know about the child? Uh, so now um, you've made this diagnosis, you agree with the outside refer that this is in fact complete heart block. So uh, how, what do you think you want to do about this? Well, first thing you'd want to assess if they're stable and tolerating this rhythm at this moment in time. Yes, it's a good question. Always important. Child looks great. Cute child, uh, mm -hmm. cute little boy is feeding well is gaining weight well, is at the 55th percentile for height and weight. It's very Great. active, according to his mother. And then I'd want to ask if there was any kind of inciting incidents prior to this rhythm strip. Did he undergo surgery? Did he, was he infectious at all? Well, he's never I had surgery. He, uh, <clears throat> he was uh, preemie. Mm -hmm. Does that help you at all? Um, did he autoimmune or thyroid or endocrinopathies that we're aware of you mean in the child yeah uh, no or the aware. mother for that matter which one in the mother would you be concerned about uh particularly any kind of um thyroid type issue lupus or um any kind of rheumatologic issues associated with heart block in the child right so maternal lupus is number one two three four five and six and the most mm -hmm. important concerns um and it's not uncommon that the first sign of positive lupus antibodies in a woman is having a child with heart block. Um, interestingly, in this case, I believe that the patient's mother had not yet had lupus antibody testing. But the fact that the child was premature, is there a possibility that could offer you some information? Like you, this child was diagnosed, let's say, at six months. Uh, we mm -hmm. want to know about anything earlier in this child's life besides the fact that they didn't have heart surgery or, and you're right. I mean, did they have surgery, a prolonged NICU stay? They did have a prolonged NICU stay. And is there anything that you could get from reviewing the NICU records that would help you? Because this was diagnosed at a regular routine pediatric visit at about five months of age. Yeah, you can, I'm sure the child had an EKG or some sort of rhythm strip in the NICU. Um, so to establish if that was holding true back then or if this is a yeah. new finding yeah we want to know if it's congenital if it's congenital then the idea of a maternal antibody problem such as lupus would be much more likely right uh, mm -hmm. if that were the case and in fact uh, in this case um, apparently there's a lot of documentation of heart rates in the 140s so at least according to what we believe um or what I've been told, this child had normal heart rates in the past. Um, so uh, I think a full genetic panel was done and nothing came up positive on this patient. So we don't actually know why this patient has a heart block. So so the patient is sitting there, has a heart rate of about 70 and uh, mm -hmm. is looking okay and uh, feels all right. Um, so how are you going to make a determination? So is there any treatment you want to do for this patient, medical or surgical? Any sort? I think um, if the patient was tolerating it hemodynamically, I'd want to see if there was any kind of medical etiologies that were reversible first and foremost. So Okay, so what would you, what kind of testing would you do to look for that? And what, what medical conditions are you concerned about? So thyroid testing, um, Lyme testing, uh, just to see if there's something treatable from a medical standpoint. Okay. Um, and if that was not the case, ultimately, I believe this child would need a pacemaker. Uh, well, so um, 
would you uh, would there be any men, any benefit of obtaining an echocardiogram in this child? What yeah. other what other things that you sometimes see in the ICU can cause heart block? Um, certain kind of congenital anomalies, um, but I imagine they would have been picked up prior. Yeah, you could to... have uh, L transposition or mm -hmm. or uh, certain forms of. Uh, you know, the, the mm -hmm. LTGA would be the most common, although usually unoperated LTGA patients in the newborn period do not have heart block, but they can. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, echo would also be useful in terms of ruling out. Yeah, to make sure that the patient doesn't have um, myocarditis or something like that. What would mm -hmm. you expect? Let's assume the echo that the child does not have myocarditis and is uh, has. Would there be any any common finding you'd see in a child who has heart block? What would you expect in a echocardiogram on someone with heart block who is not actually suffering from something that also affects the function or something like that? What's a typical response to these slow heart rates? Um, I'm not sure. Well, you would normally, right? There's only two ways that we can augment our cardiac output. One is heart rate which mm -hmm. if you have heart block, you can't do very easily. And the other is um, is stroke volume, but the stroke volume can only be augmented to a certain degree. The heart right. is not a balloon that can just, you know, in, enlarge to uh, any size, but the heart can enlarge a little bit. So in somebody who has heart block, um, a good way to tell if they've been in it for a while is to look at the ventricular dimensions. Um, it's very common that patients will have a little bit of LV uh, dilation, which is compensation. It's not unlike, for example, uh, high degree athletes who are have very high levels of cardiovascular fitness, who also have very dilated ventricles, mm -hmm. LV. So uh, this child did in fact have normal ventricular function, but did have uh, mild, mild, uh, uh, left ventricular enlargement, which again is a normal adaptation to slow heart rates. So the way that we determine whether, uh, is there any other testing you wanted to do uh, in terms of uh, assessing this patient's stability? And um, You could put a Zio or follow their telly for a yeah. while to see if there's any arrhythmia burden. I imagine this patient would probably be inpatient at this point. So well, yeah, that's probably true, especially if it's a new finding. But mm -hmm. most important thing is you want to see a couple of things. So there actually are, um, you know, just because you have, so if you have heart block after surgery, we've already talked many times how if, you, if you're past, you know, eight to 10 days, you basically have to get a pacemaker, at least according to present rules. And we'll go over that in a moment. But if you do not have congenital heart disease, the question is, um, who merits a pacemaker and who does not? And there are, in fact, uh, formal rules on this. And uh, this was updated just two years ago. Uh, this is the 2021 PACES Expert Consensus Statement on Indications and Management of CIEDs in Pediatric Patients. And Molly Shah, who's at um, Johns Hospital Philadelphia, is the first author and a lot of prominent people. And this statement is endorsed by the ACC, the Heart Rhythm Society, the American Heart Association, the European Association, the Indian Heart Rhythm Society, and the, the Latin American Heart Society, and the Asia Pacific Heart Rhythm Society. So basically, this is, this is the state of the art or the present recommendations agreed upon by basically all all the known major rhythm organizations throughout the world. So, and you should, This is. these are important. This is very important. And in fact, I am in the process, as you know, you have to recertify your boards. And now they have a process where you do it at at, uh, at home. You have to take like 20 questions a quarter. And uh, I just had my quarterly test and this came up. This was exact question like this. Uh, and this paper was referenced. So this is very important. So uh, class one indication is basically means you must do it. If you don't do it, you are considered to be not practicing proper medicine. Class 2A is pretty much uh, largely recommended. 
uh, you're not malpractice committer if you don't do it, but you basically, most everybody would do it. And 2B is usually things that people would usually not do, wouldn't call you terrible to do it, but generally speaking, our, our um, recommendations to not do things. So in the class one, uh, per permanent, this is for isolated congenital completed <laughs> block. Now, this is not exactly, uh, you know, congenital because we believe that the conduction was normal based on the history of a normal heart rate, but this is the closest analogy that we can draw. So if the patient is symptomatic with bradycardia, a pacemaker would be indicated. I'll give you an example. A number of years ago, I was following a young lady who was uh, about two or three years old. I met her when she was uh, an infant. She was doing great for a while. And then when she started going to nursery school, her nursery school teacher noticed that she seemed to take breaks more often. And her mother said that at home, she needed to take a lot of naps. And uh, it was a very distinct difference when she was about two and a half or three. We put an epicardial pacemaker in her and she immediately improved and is completely fine now. Um, so that would be an example of somebody with symptomatic bradycardia. Permanent pacemakers indicated for people with congenital complete AV block with a wide QRS escape rhythm, complex ventricular activity or ventricular dysfunction. So this would be one of the indications for a ZO patch in this patient group. So um, if you, you know, this actually was the question that I was asked on my board recertification one of the choices about whether, you know, which of these indications would be an indication for a pacemaker. And the answer is if there's a wide escape QRS rhythm instead of the narrow one or whatever the usual one is, right? I think in this case, we would agree that this is a very narrow uh, QRS escape rhythm. So if you started to see pauses in this rhythm with wide QRSs instead, that would be a uh, considered a worrisome sign and an indication for a pacemaker. And then there are actual absolute rates. Permanent pacemaker implantation is indicated in an asymptomatic neonatal infant when the mean rate is less than or equal to 50. And that's another reason why getting a ZO or a halter or a Barty device is very important because it allows you to get an average heart rate. Ventricular rate alone should not be used as an implant criteria as symptoms due to low cardiac output may occur at faster rates. So they're basically saying is, if you're slow above 50 and you're symptomatic, you probably need a pacemaker. Um, but if you're less than 50, probably you do need a pacemaker, even if you're not symptomatic. Um, then uh, in the 2A, which are the, again, the recommendations that most people say you should probably do, pacemaker implantation is reasonable for asymptomatic complete AV block beyond the first year of life when the mean ventricular rate is less than 50 or there are prolonged pauses in ventricular rate. So for example, I follow a teenager uh, who has congenital complete AV block and, and they she comes back with uh, heart rates of 47, 52, 49, 50. She is completely asymptomatic. So I'm waiting, but I'm cognizant, as is the family, that we're getting close to putting one in. Uh, the second 2A indication is permanent pacemaker implantation is reasonable for congenital complete AV block with LV dilation associated with significant MR or, significant, or systolic dysfunction. So we've already discussed this morning that <clears throat> dilation of the left ventricle is very common. The patient's the patient whose EKG we looked at this morning had a Z score of about 2.2 for the LV dimension, so only a little bit enlarged. Um, but it's not just the Z score; it's also a Z score with mitral regurgitation or systolic dysfunction. I have to say, I have rarely seen systolic dysfunction in people with AV block, um, uh, nor have I really even seen a lot of MR uh, in people with uh, AV block, but it might be because we put pacemakers on people, but they may get more symptomatic when they're starting to get that. Now, in a 2B category, again, this is a group where they would generally recommend uh, not doing it. Um, permanent pacemaker implantation may be considered for congenital complete AV block in asymptomatic adolescents with an acceptable ventricular rate and narrow QRS complex and normal ventricular function based on individualized consideration of the risk-benefit ratio. So essentially they're saying that's a patient whom you typically would not normally place a pacemaker. And here are some uh, other considerations. 
uh, for AV block that would be recommended. And the class one indications, permanent pacemaker implantation indicated with clinically significant ventricular tachycardia that's pause dependent or associated with severe bradycardia and ICD implantation should be considered as a reasonable alternative. So there are people who have pause dependent ventricular tachycardia. So they have like a three second pause and they have a four beat run of VT. That is a worrisome finding that would be considered an indication for a pacemaker. Permanent pacing is indicated in symptomatic patients with uh, idiopathic advanced second or third degree AV block, not attributable to reversible causes. So again, Basically, anybody who is symptomatic and has heart block should probably have a pacemaker uh, in that case, unless you know it's a reversible cause. 2A, permanent pacemaker implantation reasonable for any degree of AV block that progresses to advanced second or third degree with exercise in the absence of reversible causes. So, so uh, this is probably an indication or a suggestion that um, in an asymptomatic patient, or maybe even in a symptomatic patient, consideration of doing a stress test to see if the heart block worsens with heart, faster heart rates and higher adrenergic tone, which would be distinctly abnormal, right? Normally, even people who have some degree of heart block, oftentimes the AV node will improve as the vagal tone is, re is reduced with exercise. Um, if you see the opposite, that probably is a worrisome sign. Um, and then in the 2B category, which is, you know, some people can do it, but they wouldn't necessarily recommend that permanent pacemaker implantation may be considered for patients with intermittent advanced second or third degree AV block not attributable to reversible causes and associated with minimal symptoms that are otherwise unexplained. So you're essentially saying, you know, you can do it, but probably if they're unexplained, you should figure out why they, you know, explain it first. Um, and then here they're saying this would be considered do not do class. Uh, a class three recommendation of harm, permanent pacemaker implantation is not indicated for asymptomatic first degree AV block or MOBIT uh, type one. And of course, we've seen many cases uh, throughout EP conference of people with first degree or MOBITS one. And obviously we have never once made the comment that they deserve a pacemaker. Uh, but again, there are rarely patients who have this and are symptomatic. Um, but I will be honest in saying I have not yet met one but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, and then just for completeness sake, uh, looking at post-operative AV block, permanent pacemaker implantation is indicated as a class one indication for post-op advanced second or three, third degree AV block that persists at least seven to 10 days after cardiac surgery. This is something that um, you know we're all very well aware of, and that's where, and this is based on a number of papers, that go back at least 25 to 30 years and have been reconfirmed in more recent studies showing that by about day uh, eight to 10, the chances, the statistical likelihood of recovery of AV conduction is less than two to 3%. And so at that point, uh, pacemaker implantation would be recommended. Um, let me actually ask, uh, let me ask Maya. Maya, if somebody has heart block, after surgery, went into surgery conducting, comes out not conducting, and the, you know, you're pacing them and you're explaining to the family why you're pacing them. Uh, and then the patient's family says, uh, well, doctor, is my child going to need a pacemaker? Um, what would you tell them are the statistics on that? So it depends what post-op day you are. Um, Let's I think say we're post-op day one. So I think post-op day one at that point, there's still like I think two thirds chance that they'll recover. Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, like by post-op day four, it gets less likely that they're gonna recover. Um, probably like 95%, I think. Yeah. Um, That's true. So you're saying basically, if you take all comers right out of the operating room in heart block, mm -hmm. two thirds will recover. Am, is, am I stating what you said correctly? Is that what you meant to say? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's true. That's absolutely right. And that's the most important thing that we have to tell uh, parents. Um, and you're right that as the days pass, probably the likelihood of recovery becomes less. Mm -hmm. The other thing I will say is that, um, Sometimes surgeons will tell us uh, this is not coming back. 
I have found that a surgeon's ability to predict that is terrible. <laughs> they almost never are right, at least not the ones I've worked with in the last 25 years. Um, so, but I think that, you know, the, the more extensive the surgery, I think probably the more likely it's not going to recover, but um, uh, it's, it's remarkable how, how the surgeon can be wrong about this. Um, but um, yes, so that's what we would say. So another class one indication, permanent pacemaker amputation is, we talked about this, for late onset advanced second or third degree block, especially when there's a prior history of transient post-op AV block. So there are uh, cases and reports of people who have to, who have recovered their AV conduction in the perioperative period, but later on have um, advanced second or th third degree block and have needed a pacemaker. And I think I'm actually an author on one of these three references that are listed there. Uh, when I was at Columbia, Leo Lieberman and I wrote a paper on a handful of patients who uh, left the hospital conducting, but la in late follow-up were identified to not have conduction. So uh, that can happen. And I'm always nervous whenever we have a patient who recovers conduction on like post-op day seven or eight or nine. And we have it, right? I think many of you, probably you for sure, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, that Ivana has seen somebody who has recovered uh, during her critical care fellowship uh, on the late side, um, but I always get worried about them. Now, sometimes those patients are very sick, and so we have the opportunity to still observe them for a long time in the hospital. That makes me feel less uncomfortable. Like I would hate to send somebody home on post-update 12 who, who recovered on post-update 10, but that happens sometimes. And those patients just need a very high degree of surveillance. Um, uh, now, two, now these are all 2B indications where basically it would not be recommended. So permanent pacemaker implantation may be considered for unexplained syncope in patients with a history of transient postoperative advanced second or third degree AV block. Uh, so they're basically saying, again, you can do it, but most of the time it is not indicated. Permanent pacemaker implantation may be considered at less than seven postoperative days when advanced second or third degree AV block is not expected to resolve due to extensive injury to the cardiac conduction system. So this is this is basically a recognition of what I just said, which is that sometimes conduction can come back late, um, um, and you don't really know. Uh, but there are cases, uh, I've been involved in many cases where we've put pacemakers into patients less than seven to 10 days. Um, in fact, we had one just a couple of months ago, a patient of Ragavs, who he felt pretty confident, unfortunately had injured the nose, excellent repair, just had heart block. And, um, and actually he predicted correctly, that patient did not recover, thankfully got an outstanding pacemaker implant and a very excellent pacemaker. Uh, great repair, just has heart block. But in that case, uh, I believe that he made that decision because he had to close the chest. And uh, he felt that, you know, closing and then opening and uh, would have been, uh, you know, potentially an infectious risk. And so he took the risk that uh, that was the right thing to do. And I think he made the right choice. Um, and then finally, permanent pacemaker implantation may be considered in select patients with transient post-operative advanced second or third degree AV block who are predisposed to progressive conduction abnormalities. So there are, you know, for example, uh, you could consider like an L transposition patient in whom we know that there is a 1% annual cumulative risk of heart block over the course of a lifetime. So if somebody who had surgery with LTGA had transient block, I think most people would not put a pacemaker on such a patient permanently if they were conducting. Uh, but what they're saying here is that uh, it wouldn't be wrong, but it wouldn't be their recommendation, basically. Uh, any questions about this? So in this case, uh, this this baby that we looked at um, had monitoring. And basically, the monitor showed uh, an average heart rate in the sick, low 60s. Uh, it does go down, sometimes as low as the 30s. Uh, with sleep, but the child is completely asymptomatic. And uh, I mean, why do we want to wait? What is the, what's the benefit of waiting? Uh, why don't I ask uh, Kataki? So Kataki, what, a, why would we wait? I mean, I think we would all agree that if we could give this child a normal heart rate, 
uh, that might be of some benefit to the child? Why are we not just going ahead and putting one in and making them, you know, a little bit better? Uh, good morning, Dr. Pass. I think uh, we would like uh, the child uh, to recover on its own because if we put in a permanent pacemaker, um, uh, maybe we are trying to avoid or delay the placement of a permanent pacemaker. Okay, so let me let me restate it. I'm not being clear. I'm saying like in that case that I gave where a child had not had surgery, so which is common. Uh, so right. So in a person who had heart surgery, yes, we would always want to wait as long as possible because we want to give the chance to recover. But in somebody who comes in who has a permanent, complete heart block, such as uh, our original case today, like this child, why? Why? I mean, according to these recommendations, this child does not meet criteria for a pacemaker at this time. Why would we not want to put a pacemaker in this patient. Why, why is it a benefit to the child not to put a pacemaker in? Um, I would think the child is like six months old, so probably we are waiting for the child to get older. Uh, I mean, we can put epicardial pacemakers. We sometimes put them in newborns, right, when they have heart block after surgery. So technically it's possible. Um... I'm not so there are, you know, I would say there are a couple of reasons. The first is epicardial wires in general don't last as well as endocardial leads. So um, especially with small children, they can fracture with uh, falling or just growth or movement. So anytime you put an epicardial system in, there's always the possibility that the system is going to be fragile and not durable for the long haul. So, uh, so you putting a child through a relatively big surgery, which involves a thoracotomy or a sternotomy, and um, you might two years from then not have a functional system. Uh, so that's the first thing. Now, most of the time that's not true. You know, Rogov uh, often becomes our go-to pacemaker surgeon and he's superb and I have never seen one of his not work long-term. I mean, and I've been here now five years. So everyone he's put in has been great. Um, so there's clearly a knack to it, but the point is it still can break. Um, second, we've talked about the fact that there are rarely late coronary strangulation from epicardial leads. Um, and so um, not a concern at implantation, but, you know, could be. Third, uh, risk for infection. And uh, any time pacemaker, there's a risk of infection and uh, not insignificant. And if one of these systems was infected, potentially it would potentially mean having to remove not only the pacemaker, but the lead itself, uh, which would be a big deal because it's epicardial. Um, so those would be the main things. And we couldn't really put a transvenous system in a six month old because uh, first of all, the lead would not be long enough for allow for growth. Um, it would almost certainly cause thrombosis of the um, of the axillary or the cephalic vein, making it impossible to put further leads in the future. Um, and then finally, uh, there have been sh you know in the past, like twenty five years ago, cardiologists and surgeons did try to put transvenous pacemakers, even with those limitations in small children and the incidence of erosion of the device through the skin because kids don't have as much fat and um, you know, uh, and, and such subcutaneous tissue was very high. And so transvenous pacing is really not an option in uh, small children. Um, so, so yeah, if we can avoid pacemaker implantation as long as possible, uh, it just will mean less total surgeries for the patient. And each of those surgeries carries, you know, a myriad number of risks. So we really don't want to put a pacemaker in anybody uh, until we absolutely have to. And so we will often wait as late as possible uh, to put them in first on the hope that we can get them to an age that's big enough to put a transvenous system in. And then even at that time, we'll try to uh, wait as long as possible to not access the golden left axillary and subclavian veins so that um, patient has the best chances of maintaining patency of that vein as long as possible. Because remember that even the most perfectly placed pacemaker leads, we would be lucky if we got 30 to 40 years of longevity out of it. If you look at 
pacemaker lead longevity. Uh, for epicardial leads, I think the average is in the range of a decade or less. Um, and for transvenous, it really depends on the age group and the paper you're reading. But, um, you know, we wrote a paper about 15 years ago looking at transvenous ICD leads in kids. And at that time, and I think still today, it was one of the better longevities, but still at 10 years, I think uh, the survival rate of the leads was only like 89%. So, and that's like amongst the best reports. So uh, point is um, once you put in any pacing system and leads included, you could imagine that the clock is starting to tick on the longevity of the system. So if it is safe, to not put a pacemaker uh, in a patient um, and it meets the criteria that we've just reviewed, then we would generally not want to put a pacemaker in as long as we can. And that's the reason, for example, why in this teenager I mentioned earlier, who's a teenager, uh, he's uh, she's plenty big enough to have a pacemaker, but I'm waiting because she's not really quite meeting any of the formal criteria. She's very, very close, but she's completely and totally asymptomatic. And so I'm dragging my feet as long as I possibly can uh, to try and improve her future life and pacing options. All right, any questions about this? Yeah, it's just a quick question, Dr. Pass. In terms of following this particular patient up, so if the kid already had some dilation of his LV, what interval would you follow him up? And I guess would the threshold be progressive dilation over a shorter right. period of time or once you get to that Z-score of negative three? So that's so remember, it's a z square of three with MR. Um, so uh, I mean, generally, what I do in almost anything that needs to be followed up when you meet a person for the first time, uh, you have to sort of first have an understanding of how quickly these things evolve uh, in general, and then how quickly they might be evolving in your patient. So this is true for the person you see who has a subaortic VSD and has trivial AI, you know, how often do you follow that patient? So what my general rule is when I first met a patient and I don't really know them very well, um, I might see them reasonably soon, like maybe four to six months, just to confirm that things aren't changing. You know, as they say, you need to have two points on the curve to understand at least something about a rate of progression of something. Um, but then this is the type of patient who, if asymptomatic, I would probably follow annually as, as long as the initial shortish uh, uh, evaluation showed no obvious big changes. Um, the key is always is just to continuously follow the patients. It's rare the patients get profoundly worse quickly. You know, the patients who get I get more worried about are people who have advanced second degree block. We know what the natural history of congenital or this type of heart block generally is, which is it generally gets slower over time. Uh, and then you can have any of the things that we just reviewed in this uh, consensus statement, and then you put a pacemaker in. But it's unusual, though not unheard of, but unusual for patients to get into trouble, like having Stokes Adams attacks or things like that, if you're monitoring them regularly uh, for this. When somebody has second degree block, though, uh, we don't know whether we don't know why they have it sometimes, and we don't know what the progression is going to be. So those types of patients scare me a little more because everybody's second degree block is a little bit different. And, you know, sometimes patients can have um, it can progress a lot faster and uh, or they could get more simply. In other words, we don't we know this child has an adequate heart rate in heart block, complete heart block. We don't know in, a, in someone with second degree block what their heart rate is going to be if it were to progress from second to third. Um, they might have a heart rate of 33. Um, so that's the, that is the concern um, in terms of uh, that I have when I see a second degree, high grade second degree block versus person who has third degree. If they have third degree, you pretty much have at least some understanding of what the future will hold and it, it helps inform decisions regarding surveillance. All right, is this uh, somewhat helpful today? That was great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Uh, I'll see you at uh, sign out in a short while. Bye-bye.